So welcome everyone to this virtual dinner party for early career researchers and practitioners in GLAM and academia. Um, I think we'll be eating salad at this dinner party because of the hot weather today. So our session today is an interactive session where we want to give early career researchers and practitioners the opportunity to dig into relevant topics such as inclusion, training, well-being and career planning in the digital space. This session is open to delegates attending the DCDC conference, as well as ECRs and DCPs from the sector more widely. For those of you who haven't heard of the DCDC conference before, it stands for Discovering Collections, Discovering Communities, and it's a cross-sectoral conference bringing together delegates from all career stages, working within galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and academia. The conference is run by the National Archives, Research Libraries UK and JISC. Before we start with the session today, I'd just quickly like to mention a survey that we're running at the National Archives dedicated to early career researchers and practitioners. We're hoping to understand more about the sorts of training and opportunities that you'd like the National Archives to offer. Um, and you'll find the link to the survey in the chat coming up soon. We'd be grateful if you could find the time to complete the survey and pass it on to colleagues. I'd also like to say before we start that we're pleased to have Ozzy from the Live Doodle company joining us today. He will be live doodling some of the discussion and we'll check in with him throughout the event to see how he's getting on and how he's visually represented some of what we've been talking about today. OK, so to get us started on the first course of our dinner party, we're going to just introduce um, some of the early career speakers that we have with us today. Um, so if I could ask all of the speakers to turn their camera on, that would be great. Um, and if um, each of you could just say a few words briefly introducing yourselves and a little about um, the career stage you're at um, and how you're finding the sector currently. So first up, we have Anita Goldschmidt. So Anita, um, can you just introduce yourself briefly, please? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Anita Z. Goldschmidt. I have uh, dark brown hair and I wear a black uh, top today. I completed my PhD just over a year ago. I work in academia and I'm a senior lecturer at the moment. In terms of uh, my uh, backgrounds, I, I come from an interprofessional background. I'm a duly qualified health and social care practitioner, but I did my master and PhD with the Faculty of Arts, so hence my connection with archives and the broader sector. So, so yes, I guess I find myself between sectors and disciplines as an early career researcher. So thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, Pushpi Bakshi, could I come to you? Thanks, Louise. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pushpi Bakshi. I'm a South Asian designer and participatory design researcher. Um, and I am wearing, I don't know if you can see it, but a brightly colored top. Um, so I finished my PhD in uh, November last year, and at the moment I am in the first year of a, po a two-year postdoc at the University of Edinburgh based in the Edinburgh Futures Institute, and my practice and research at the moment is sort of based in, again, participatory methods and facilitating interdisciplinary collaboration, um, and that's why I thought it, it would be interesting to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Pushby. Um, Karina Westling, um, are you there? Are you able to turn your camera on to, so we can see you? That would be great. My, I have brown, kind of slightly frizzy hair because Amsterdam, where I'm sitting now, is very hot, very summery. Um, so I've got uh, glasses and, um, yeah, hot and bothered, but very, very happy to be here. I am an early career researcher. I did my PhD at Sussex. I work with specifically interactive um, works of art across physical and digital platforms and how we think about audiences. So I'll be talking a little bit later about my research with Punch Drunk and other types of performances. And I welcome any kind of audience engagement and of course my esteemed peers. Thank you, Karina. Um, Amy Webster. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. I'm a senior lecturer in education studies. I'm based up at Bishop Rustess University in Lincoln. And I completed my PhD just around the start of the pandemic. I was based at Cambridge before 
in education studies, but particularly in terms of children's literature. So involved engaging with some archives at the British Library and at Cambridge, looking at children's books. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing thoughts from fellow early career people as well, um, as I start to explore some of the potential issues I've come across with both being an ECA, ECR in this area, but also particularly at the time of the pandemic too. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Look forward to hearing more in a second. Um, and Gareth Millward. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Gareth Millward. I'm a millennial white man, short hair, beard uh, and a shirt. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if I'm an ECR any longer. I passed my uh, PhD in 2014 uh, and have done various postdocs in the United Kingdom since then. But in February, I started here uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Southern Denmark in Ornse in Denmark. Um, and my experience with uh, using, uh, doing digital humanities uh, has been around uh, the use of web archives and working uh, as a solo researcher uh, using web archives in my history work on the history of the post-war welfare state in Britain, uh, but also some work with uh, the British Library uh, in thinking about how historians might use web archives in the future and how they might be using them uh, today. And that's something that I'll speak about a little bit later. Amazing. Thank you, Gareth. Um, so we've had a brief introduction from all our speakers. Now we're going to move on to our second course. Um, how it works is we're going to have two of our speakers do a brief presentation around a theme um, and then we'll invite some discussion after. So um, please put things in the chat, but also volunteer to come up with us and join the panel and share um, your view. So for the second course, the theme is all around inclusion. Um, in this digital space. So how does it relate to um, some of the work that um, our speakers are doing? What ways could they be better supported and how would they like to support others? So we've got two speakers in this section. The first one is Pushpi and then the second one is Anita. So Pushpi, I'll hand over to you first. Thanks, Louise. So hopefully my screen sharing gimmick works again. So perhaps I'll just share my entire screen. And can everybody see the slides? Yep, that's working. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, so today I thought I'd share a bit about a project that I worked on last summer. And this was just sort of after I had submitted my PhD thesis. And um, at this point, you know, August 2021, we were at two years of uh, lockdown at various stages. And the University of Edinburgh, where I'm based, we, um, there was basically a pot of money that most senior academics would traditionally use for attending conferences and sort of jet setting around the world, which had been unused. And um, thankfully, one of the uh, one of the senior academics, um, Dr. Maria Soledad Garcia, decided to use that money to fund a short project to figure out, you know, what does it mean to design peer networks um, using digital pathways, especially in this post-COVID world, because a lot of the research at the time was suggesting how ECRs were going to be um, negatively impacted by the lack of ability to attend conferences and develop networks um, in, through in-person interactions. And our aim was to basically help identify what are the gaps that we found and also what were potential opportunities that could help facilitate research networks, um, facilitate mentoring and collaborations, especially amongst interdisciplinary academics um, who, you know, a lot of people felt that moving to online formats, people were sort of within their existing networks, perhaps building stronger bonds, but those serendipitous connections that you make with people in person had been lost. So how, how do you sort help catalyze some of that. Um, and I thought I'd talk a bit about two issues that came up through this uh, project. Um, also to say that it wasn't just people at the University of Edinburgh who we were speaking to. Um, we also had uh, ECRs from University College Dublin's Institute for Discovery who took part. Um, it was through a, base, uh, a series of Zoom workshops and interviews. Um, we didn't just interview ECRs. We also spoke to a lot of senior academics because we felt that you know you can't help you know, there's no point in talking about collaborations and mentorships unless you had people who were potential mentors participate and give their views. Um, so as you can see from this list, it was quite an interdisciplinary project. Um, it was sort of trying to get as many voices in from different parts of the university and external institutions as well. So uh, 
again, the two insights that I want to share is who is an ECR? And the second was this idea of potential digital fellowships in a post COVID world. And um, so for our working definition, you know, we tried to be as inclusive as possible. So we said, you know, an ECR is anybody who is a researcher, academic, practitioner, or a tutor who is in the early stages of career development. Um, because, you know, when we were looking at sort of defining an ECR, we realized that there was a, a lack of consistency of how an ECR is, is described. Uh, as an example, the British Academy's postdoctoral fellowships, you know, identifies an ECR as somebody who's within three years of having been awarded their PhD. The AHRC says it's eight years of being awarded a PhD or equivalent of professional training. Within the University of Edinburgh where I'm based, you know, there was um, sort of a acknowledgement of fixed term research staff. So people like me who are uh, research associates or postdocs, as well as um, academics who were on tenure track positions with uh, full time contracts. Um, but then, you know, it wasn't including PhD candidates, even though doctoral students quite often as part of their workload include teaching or working in research within teams, tutoring, marking, preparing didactic materials, but they were not considered as part of their sort of ECR identity. So this issue we felt became more and more prevalent when it came to accessing opportunities because you know people do their PhDs at different times in their life so the fact that our own institute wasn't considering a PhD practitioner or researcher as an early career researcher we found problematic and in general the lack of consistency uh, you know within institutions in the UK and even w wider in Europe because there was um, so much mismatch that it creates feelings of exclusion um, and compromise in a way. So it's just something that, you know, we were quite clear about and, and felt that there really needs to be some kind of push to have more of an inclusive definition um, of who is an ECR and who should be considered an ECR. Um, the next was this idea of digital fellowships, because again, uh, you know, when people were stuck in one place, we realized that, right, you're again, uh, losing an opportunity to build networks and move to places for short amounts of time. But at the same time, we felt that the potential of a digital fellowship, there was also um, an opportunity for people who perhaps can't travel with ease as much. So here we were, you know, particularly thinking of um, uh, people who are you know, researchers, uh, early career researchers who are based in parts of the world where uh, you need visas to travel into the UK or Europe. Um, and there are these other sort of political um, barriers that come into play. And therefore, the idea of a digital research uh, fellowship could be more inclusive. At the same time, there was a lot of discussion about the necessity for that, that in order for any sort of digital collaboration or fellowship or project to be successful, there had to be Ideally, there should have been pre-existing social relations and also clear structures of engagement. And this sort of map that we developed sort of helped identify, you know, what could be the perceived benefits, um, what were some of the concerns, um, and what were some of the recommendations for this sort of format. Um, um, and again, I'm happy to share these slides uh, afterwards if, if anybody's interested. But again, you know, so for example, in, in the benefits, you know, this idea that you don't need visas, you don't need a lot of uh, paperwork for non-EU participants, it could be more inclusive, um, it could allow for more interdisciplinarity, um, and then at the same time that there could be a lack of mentorship, there could be a feeling of isolation that if somebody's sitting in their flat in, um, in Lagos, Nigeria, and, you know, they're doing a digital fellowship in Edinburgh, then they might feel completely cut off um, at the same time. Um, and, and there are some recommendations from the group um, for how, you know, these digital fellowships could come across. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, that these are just some thoughts that I thought I'd share for today. And thank you everyone for your time. And I look forward to the discussion afterwards. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Pushpi, that's great. Um, we'll hear from Anita next and then we'll um, discuss some of these ideas. So Anita, over to you. Yes, thank you. So hopefully, can you hear me? Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, I work in terms of my PhD and my present research, I work with images, storage, objects, and try to co-author research with my clients. So I think it's very nicely follows up the previous presentation. I started exploring alternative ways of community engagement and, and inclusion and the digital is, uh, is one of those uh, uh, ways. And uh, in particular, dissemination and how we can share 
research and, and co-work beyond uh, traditional outputs. So I brought here today just a very short sample, which is part of a lo longer work. So I thought it might be interesting to see a bit of an illustration. It is based on my uh, doctoral work. And the topic of this particular piece was joy and the everyday experiences of people with uh, living with disabilities. So I will try to share my screen now and hopefully you can see just a minute of this. So let's, so hopefully you can see now the shared screen. I will start playing it then and I will come back to it after then. Thank you. Day after day, I was walking the streets, listening to the sounds of guitar. talking and laughing with Jane and Peter. Their lives are joyful and we wanted to share this joy with you. But how, how can we better work with the everyday experiences of hidden disability to come up with something, a more innovative approach that attempts to match our everyday life and all of its surprises? Peter responds, tells it all. Peter was collecting the board game one day in the autism group the dictionaries and all the other actors needed play his favorite game, Scrabble. Every week in the autism support group, he plays with his friends and volunteers. He went to the back of the building, approached the big gray cupboard, took out all items and made his way back to the main hall. I could not help and the spectacle became part of the act. I asked Peter, Peter, can I help you carry something? I do not need help. Peter responded immediately, I do not carry anything. The board game carries me. Thank you. Let me just stop sharing and hopefully you come back to me. So uh, I thought this is a, just a demonstration that how I try to move towards and exploit more the digital and what it can offer us in, in teaching as well as in research. Uh, and uh, the feedback I received was very positive, and I thought I think it opens up more opportunities to engagement and inclusion uh, with a wider audience. But I thought that I talked today is uh, that is not really not as straightforward, and um, there are some very pragmatic issues that I sort of experienced as an early career researcher working uh, with the digital. I called this uh, Pat, Patrick, or Patricia, the kind of. Uh, 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 barriers or, or issues. Uh, P stands for platforms, uh, A is accessibility, and T is time. So platforms uh, making digital outputs, using them uh, requires platform that is not always ready, or uh, sometimes they are out of date by the time uh, I try to use it or try to share uh, research So uh, and, and the academic work uh, how much the academic uh, world is ready to accommodate and appreciate this kind of digital uh, uh, output. Uh, accessibility, I think, is uh, both in terms of uh, our different age and, and relationship with the digital. It makes a difference how much we can engage and how much I can engage, and also some of the more physical and more traditional barriers that what uh, what we can access and how probably one of the most obvious would be money that what what we can access and uh, the third in the pet model would be tea and time which we just never have enough and and creating some of these more digital outputs like even just this uh, animated video is takes much longer uh, than than writing an article or, or a presentation so how we can uh, we can work with them. So uh, in terms of my, as an early career researcher, uh, the digital is here. Uh, in fact, I think the digital is already outruns in many ways the material. And, and if one thing for me as an early career researcher here is that uh, I feel sometimes that we are between two words, academia, most established academia and, and practice that built without the digital and the next generation who definitely will be everything digital and, and where we are here. So I think for me, the question is as an early career researcher that how we can support us as well as others with, so pet platform accessibility and time do not get into the way of, of digital in innovation. So I hope we can have a bit of a discussion about this, how we can find, solution and and in, yeah and uh, community engagement so yeah thank you thanks very much anita 
Um, so that concludes our presentations for the second course. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, have a bit of a discussion. Um, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on the challenges we face in um, making inclusive careers for um, early career researchers and professionals. As a reminder to the audience, um, if you want to join us in the discussion, you'd be very welcome. Um, so please raise your hand um, and um, we'll pop you on the screen um, and I'll ask you to ask, answer your question or comment. Um, I can see Liz in the chat is um, ready to ask a question. So um, I think she's just about to pop up on the screen. There she is. Um, so Liz, would you mind asking your question to, I think it was Pushby. If you could turn your camera on as well, that'd be great. Hi, oh, sorry. Hi, sorry, <laughs> my uh, camera was just frozen. Hi, nice to meet you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so yeah, I'm joining from the National Archives. Um, I do communications for the research team there. Uh, and we um, are kind of trying to expand our ECR audience. Um, so um, yeah, that presentation was really helpful. And I was just kind of wondering um, from your research and your experience with ECRs, do you think that there is a way to sort of help people who might be doing um, digital fellowships to kind of feel less isolated? Um, like, did you have any feedback from people or did you have any ideas when you were just kind of conducting your own, your own project? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, can, oh yeah, my mic is on. Okay. Um, thanks so much for the question, Liz. Um, so yes, there were some uh, clear recommendations that people felt quite strongly about. I think the first thing about this idea of digital fellowships, and because we had quite a few international candidates or ECRs um, who were part of the research, you know, so for example, I am Indian, I am here in the UK on now a, a graduate study visa. Um, throughout my time here, I was on a tier four student visa. So a lot of times when, you know, we would do projects, there was just so much administrative paperwork that went into my ability to travel and go across to places. So there was a clear benefit of seeing this as being uh, a digital fellowship as being more inclusive um, in that way. Um, and then the other uh, sort of recommendations that people, one of the ideas that was suggested, which was quite interesting, was this idea of a hybrid model of a fellowship where you could have um, let's say the institution that you're doing the fellowship with is based in a different country um, and then the ECR is based in a different country but perhaps they have a in-person partner who could be an industry partner or an archive or a library or another sort of um, third sector institution and that could create a sort of interesting format um, for engagement as well. Um, there was also sort of discussions about if, if we do have these sort of digital formats that um, can be figure out better ways of sharing resources. So the other idea was of, you know, potential of sharing digital data sets. Um, and the other one was sort of having a clear framework for social engagement and, and setting up that expectation right from the get go. So whether it is knowing that, you know, every week, depending on the length of the fellowship, if there is going to be a clear time for, you know, sort of these video chat calls or uh, for example where I am based just now at the Edinburgh Features Institute because we are part of an office which is very interdisciplinary we have what we call a Monday morning assembly so people are based all over the world but everybody just pops in and sort of gives an update of what they're working with so even though I've not met a lot of my colleagues in person I'm still very aware of sort of what's going on and it really helps build that idea of community so having these sort of clear frameworks for engagement so that somebody coming into the fellowship or considering applying for the uh, for, for such format of um, a fellowship knows what to expect um, um, and, and then taking it from there. So, uh, yeah, so those were just some of the initial ideas that people had. But and I think, again, in general, people were quite excited about the idea, but the biggest hesitation was always a feeling of isolation and or sort of being cut off and not actually being able to get access to resources and mentors and people like that. So how could sort of those anxieties be addressed in the initial framework from um, of, of how these fellowships are facilitated? Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pushpi, and thank you, Liz. Um, if anyone else wants to join our panel, please just raise your hand. Um, I think we'll say goodbye to you now, Liz. Um, I want to open up another question um, to all our um, speakers today um, about something Anita raised. So Anita raised um, three potential barriers for um, early careers working in this space. 
Um, so it was around the kind of platforms, um, accessibility questions, um, and the issue of time as well. So I wondered if any of our speakers could comment on how um, we might begin to overcome some of these barriers of platforms, accessibility, and time. Um, I can just, it, one of the things, um, I hope it's okay that I'm going and I don't feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation. Um, this idea of time is really interesting because I, one of the things that in, in the project that from last summer people spoke a lot about is this is this sort of time accounted for within contracts? So as early career researchers, do you have mentors or as part of your sort of of modes of engagement, is there always time set aside for personal development and facilitating collaborations? And and perhaps that should be something that is, because I think it's assumed uh, or implied that, you know, we have to do all these other things in terms of sort of furthering ourselves and our careers, but is there an explicit dedicated, you know, if you have a 35 hour work week, then a slot in the calendar that everybody has to put in and say that, okay, how is, how is that time being spent? So I think, um, it, it, it's always a tricky one of, of what, how we implicitly assume time is being spent on things, but if there's no explicit time allotted to something, then it doesn't come about. And, and so sort of creating, again, um, a sort of mode of engagement as early career researchers within, within whatever work we do to sort of set time aside for things and have that valued by institutions. Thank you, Pushpi. Anita, have you got any comments on this issue of time? Uh, yeah, I think that's why some of the outcome that you talked about in terms of structure, I think it's one of the key things, and then that just you added to that. Uh, I think we just need to really go into these details and, and at the organization level, at different sector level, think about these things and, and, and get some more, yeah, I think a more better structured uh, frameworks would be very helpful. And working with the people who are in the digital and they can be make sure that they are everywhere so they can uh, put their input in and, and help shape those uh, structures and frameworks. So yeah, thank you. So Louise, could I jump in? Yeah, go for it. Um, I thought Anita made a really interesting point about what we value as an output that I think definitely could be opened up much more. I love the idea of presenting your research and findings in some digital format like the video. It was a really powerful way and a really accessible way, but it's the divide between maybe the archives that we work with and what academia traditionally values and how you sort of the, the, the shape of the peg and the whole and how you fit those together. Um, because I remember when I was doing my PhD, a huge output was collecting together series and creating a database of that. But how did I submit that? How did I work that into the PhD? And the PhD was kind of a very 2D thing. And you submitted that and my supervisor um, insist that I submit also kind of um, memory sticks and web links to show the product of the work, which was as much a part of it as the words that I had written in the PhD as well. But then you shift post PhD in the way that we value things in terms of journal articles and written formats. Um, and that's what we're encouraged and moved towards. Um, so I think definitely there needs to be a wider conversation around outputs and how we can use those to reflect the nature of the type of archives that we're now engaging with, because there's still that discord between making use of the digital, but then not fully using it or being encouraged to use it maybe in our outputs as well. Yeah, thanks, Amy. There's a bit of a blocker, isn't there, around sticking to traditional outputs. I can see we have Connor on the um, table. Um, Connor, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? If you turn your camera on and turn, uh, yeah. turn your mic on. Brilliant. Um. Hi. Hey, hey guys. Um, I I just have a question for all for all of you, really. Um, you you guys um have all done your P, P, PhDs and stuff. I I just wonder if you had some advice for people who are starting starting out, thinking about doing a potential PhD in the digital humanities field. Like, say for example. If if they are if them they might be out of a job and the PhD they're thinking about 
you know, requires uh, a lot of access to digital technology, a lot of, um, you know, access to internet access and, you know, the kind of uh, things that they might need to access to do their research in digital humanities, like uh, web archives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm just thinking in general, do you have any advice for people who are starting out doing a PhD in this uh, area, um, how to get a how PhD proposal together if it, if it required access to technology to get a PhD proposal together? Thank you, Connor. Um, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, just give this to one speaker. Is there anyone who'd like to volunteer? Gareth? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Connor, and I'm going to try to answer it, um, albeit uh, I did my uh, PhD uh, funded as a medical historian. So uh, my funding was, I need some train tickets, I need to be able to get into dusty old archives. That was pretty much all the money that I asked for. I think it is something that is um, a an issue that uh, uh, on the one hand, I'm glad that you're considering it because it does show that you've thought through that there are there are going to be costs involved. But on the other hand, it's also then you get into the problem of, yes, but how do you actually uh, deal with that? Um, and I, from from my experience of working with people who have now moved into the digital humanities, those. Um, yes, sorry, Gillian, for saying dusty old archives, but some of them are dusty. Quite a lot of them are well kept, but I have been into uh, into uh, places where it, uh, you sort of wince at how they've been stored in these old kind of like storage lockers and thinking, well, I really hope that that some time there's some money to actually put this uh, somewhere properly. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, digital humanities have become more aware of the fact that the things cost money in the same way that historians have had to work with oral history. Uh, most of the funding bodies have now come to realize that actually it does cost quite a bit of money to be able to transcribe things, to be able to have train tickets to get places. So I would uh, I would say, uh, think about the, uh, the archives that you're likely to need to use, think about the, um, the training that you might need and think about the uh, the software and the hardware that you might need, uh, and then talk to you, the department that you're thinking of going to and seeing, okay, how much of this stuff do you already have? How much of this stuff might I be able to get access to? Uh, and then if you are thinking about using web archives and things like that, uh, then thinking about, do you need anything more than simply access to old web pages, or do you need access to data and ways of being able to crunch that data? which is a completely different kind of question. So Thank in you, general, Jeff. yeah. Um, I'm sure you will have other tips as well, but feel free to put them in the chat as we go along for other speakers. And thank you, Connor. Um, we're going to um, move on to our third course shortly, but before we do, I just want to ask Ozzy if he'd mind sharing his doodle so far of some of the things we've been talking about. If you could share your screen, Ozzy, that would be great. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, we can see inclusion, mentoring. I like the um, symbol for the Monday morning assembly, especially. Um, we'll check in with Ozzy again um, after our next course, but we'll move straight on now to our next presentations. Um, so we've got three presentations in this next part um, and I'll hand over to Karina, first of all. Hi there. So um, I will focus on collaboration and impact rich research activities to counter the kind of isolation and the, the, you know, both in a sort of post COVID environment, but also as an early career researcher, I think that isolation and the sense of not being part of a community is one of the main challenges. And it, of course, also that can then feed into um, difficulties building funding and networks and other sort of career opportunities. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to show a little bit of research about uh, that I that I do. Um, this is um, sort of a, a dinner do. So I've focused on slightly uh, quite sort of visual and hopefully inspiring content. And I hope you will enjoy that. So may I share screen? Go for it. Thank you. 
Let me see. There, I'm going to see. So can you now see a beachfront? Yes. More precisely, this is Brighton Beach. This is a lovely sunset. Brighton is where I normally reside. I am currently in Amsterdam doing the Digital Methods Summer School. Uh, Brighton is a town where people have long amassed for exploration of self, for um, extending their understanding of who they are, um, who they want to be, and ha having a lot of fun in the process. So not entirely surprisingly, this became um, a subject that inflected my research and PhD. So I'm a, oops, I'm a senior lecturer uh, in cross-platform media at um, Media and Communication in Bournemouth. And I did my PhD at the University of Sussex in 2017. Um, digital Humanities snuck into my life via the uh, SHL, the Sussex Humanities Lab, the Digital Humanities at King's College London, where I worked um, for, for a while, and of course the general tenor of my research. Since I began my PhD, I have engaged in collaboration across a range of disciplines, not only digital humanities, but also creative media, biological sciences, psychology, and software engineering. Um, these come together. Uh, obviously, I have um, um, allowed my, my, my curiosity and interests to lead me, but also I think that the social nature of research and the um, the social uh, rescue framework of an of, a, of an early career researcher to some extent drove me towards this kind of way of working and it has actually turned out to be a very functional approach I think in my own way I've also had a lot of fun as per the theme the slightly thematic um, sort of uh, subcurrent here um, my broad research theorizes participation in interactive environments and free at the point of use digital platforms. And this, um, I did the research with Punch Drunk, um, the theater company currently having a, um, a large production in London. Um, I worked with them at their previous production as, as a researcher and as a sort of a participating designer, actually, to really get my teeth into how they work with audiences. And this is published as Immersion and Participation in Punch Drunk's Theatrical World. So one of my pieces of advice for people who consider taking on a PhD and who are early career researcher is to, to look at publication because it seems to me and uh, colleagues that books and being published actually really does help. So really try and think ahead when you plan your career path so that you incorporate um, outputs that are publishable. That would be an advice that I would give, actually. Um, the kind of projects I'm, I'm, I've been working with over the last uh, few years include making heritage buildings into sort of experience machines with, um, with immersive design. Um, we during the COVID period, we I worked with Punch Drunk on the third day, their production there, the COVID theatre project, Dr. Tulp's Theatre of Zoom with Cambridge Digital Humanities. And then I carry on in the background this idea of beyond personalization, post-identitarian agency modeling for audiences and emergence in experience designs. So those are the sort of themes of my research, very social in nature. And I honestly think this sort of helped keep me sane both throughout my um, PhD research and also sustain me through the period as an ECR before I had a permanent post. Um, not going to be talking at you a great deal about text. I'm just going to show some slides. This is a slide from the Digital Ghost Hunt. Um, we worked with Heritage Buildings and uh, a theatre company who are um, engaged schools, uh, classroom experiences with a theatrical uh, narrative that stretches across the classroom into these heritage buildings where the children take on the roles as designers, co-designers of this, um, this um, these, uh, these experiences. So um, would, you some time? would you be able to wrap up, please, if that's oh, okay? Absolutely. I'll switch. So I shan't um, 
rattle on too much about immersive experience. I'll just take you through some. Um, so these are just um, so essentially audience agency is a material. It's a very social focus on 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 research, which I again I, I think has really sustained sustained me in the um, through the ECR period. Um, questions of sovereignty, ontology, privacy, and sustainability are key to my research area and my research focus, and I think they are actually in a broader sense. Um, related to the social the social environment that, that we have as, as researchers, especially in a post-COVID environment where we do connect digitally a lot of the time. So without, I'm going to stop sharing there. Thank you, Karina. We'll come back to you in the question time. Amy, over to you now. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly um, a little bit about um, some of my thoughts, my experiences, um, on the transition from PhD to early career researcher, and um, particularly in the context that I was operating, which was um, the COVID pandemic. So just a little bit um, about my own research. So um, I'd come from an education background as a qualified primary school teacher, and I started my infant education at Cambridge's um, looking at children's literature and then got into PhD and there's a centre for research there in children's literature but it's very much um, quite a traditional literary one um, and it didn't have a long history at all of people engaging um, with archives and with collections of books generally ten people tended to focus on one or two texts rather than a collection of them um, and it was just really by chance as I said that I started to think about how I could look at not just one or two books but how I could look at a collection of books um, particularly in terms of series of children's classics, how I could map the genre and get a sense of what had been published as an entirety. Um, and when I began to to think about my work in that way, um, it was then the area of, well, how do I do this? Um, and it particularly became apparent quite quickly that because there wasn't a history of that, um, I was feeling around trying to identify, well, kind of what archives can I use? What theoretical text should I be consulting? really how can I do this in kind of a practical and a digital way um, and it was through a very supportive doctoral supervisor and encouraged me this but a lot of it was on me to find this out and to search out people. At that time the Cambridge Centre for Digital Humanities was starting to get up and running a little bit more um, but it wasn't strongly linked to said children's literature studies or education and I'll be very open and honest in saying that there was um, it wasn't fully supported maybe by um, traditionalist scholars who had this conception of a literary study as involving one or two close reading texts um, as well. And so it was through other supervisors, my supervisor, through other students as well that helped with finding the resources. Um, and the PhD is very privileged in this way. What it affords you is a number of years to really study and explore a topic that's of interest to you. Um, and it also allows you that mental and physical time to adopt a new approach, even if you hadn't previously considered yourself as someone who engaged with digital archives, I've never been engaged with the British Library much, or some of the other collections of digital children's literature, including the Baldwin Library at the University of Florida. Um, but it also imposes some clear parameters, and I really liked that, that I had an idea of the subset of an archive that I wanted to look at. That was defined by search terms of children's classics and the defining parameter of the series. Um, so I completed my pandemic, my, sorry, my PhD around the time of the pandemic was starting, and I then got a full-time academic position a few months later. Um, and so very quickly, my focus had to switch from research, which had been my life, been my lived experience the last few years, to a very full-on teaching position. Um, I was teaching courses I'd never taught before. I was having to resource these um, and meet the demands of online learning. And it seemed to me that the pandemic sort of intensified some common issues that ECRs can face post PhD. Particularly, a very clear one is the lack of physical and mental time to conduct research as well. It's hard to match the teaching commitments, which are very time limited, and you've got a lecture that's got to be prepared with the research time as well. Um, and an ability to engage with digital archives in a sustained and productive way. 
Um, and also, particularly for me, it was a challenge of what, what's next. We focused on a project for a number of years um, and kind of working on turning that into a book. It's then also, well, if I want to do some future work, where could this go? Sometimes having lots of choice can be as hard as not having much kind of to carve out the area that you want and the resources that could be useful. And so just to sum up, um, there seemed to be, you know, possibly a link to the concept of accessing mentors in this area who provide guidance, particularly on the transition, and also working with archives themselves would be helpful to know the subsets of what they possess to be able to instinctively look at that and to think what could be of use to a researcher. Um, and collaboration is always welcome, both more experienced peers, but also adjacent um, to again divide up some of the time and deal with some of the kind of transition issues as well and um, so just a few very quick initial thoughts based on my own experience about this transition point and thank you Louise. Thank you, um i'll pass to gareth now and then we'll have time for one or two questions or comments afterwards um so gareth yeah uh, thank you and um that's that's a really good presentation Amy, because i think i'm at the other end of that to you in that I've gone through that middle period of uh, oh, what do I do next and what comes next. So uh, again, I'm Gareth Maward. Uh, I'm at the University of Southern Denmark and I'm in a interdisciplinary institute called the Danish Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and one of the reasons why I've been hired is as a historian, but also as somebody that does work with digital humanities and is thinking about the methods that might go along with that. That's part of my job, but not my entire job. So I've got some teaching responsibilities, but also uh, uh, research ones. And some of my teaching time has been bought out to specifically think about those things. So when, when we talk about having the time and the resources, which came up in Anita's talk as well, I kind of have some of those some of that time. So I kind of feel like I've got a bit of a responsibility to use some of it for this kind of stuff. So I got into uh, web archives and, and using them uh, mostly through uh, serendipity. I was offered um, a, a small bursary by the Institute of Historical Research in the British Library, who were doing a research project where they said, we want historians to use web archives. Think of a question that might involve web archives and then go out and do it and then report back to us on how well it went. And we'll have some workshops in between and some sort of meetings in between, but basically you're on your own. Uh, and that was brilliant in the fact that I think it will probably be the only time now in my career that I'll ever be paid to fail at doing something. But that was a major part of doing it was that we couldn't answer quite a few of the questions. And it led, led us to think about what questions are answerable as a overall philosophical problem, but also what questions are answerable with the tools that we have uh, oh. at the moment. So I've used web archives uh, throughout my work since then. I've done research projects on the history of vaccination and on the history of uh, sick notes, where uh, because it's about post Second World War British history, obviously that involves when you get to the 90s and 2000s, you have to think about the web as a as part of that. Um, but really, there's been not a huge amount of work done with the web as part of wider historical studies. So I'm also doing some uh, work uh, with the National Library of Scotland who are doing some uh, web curation work at the moment and talking with them about how that might work out. Um, but that's basically the history of my, uh, my career uh, to date. And I thought I'd end there because I did spend a bit of time answering that question. And I want to make sure that we've got some space for, for other questions as well. Oh, thank you, Gareth. How kind. Um, so um, if anyone would like to join the panel to um, make a comment or ask a question, please just put your hand up. Um, maybe in the meantime, Ozzy, could you show us um, your screen, how you're getting with the doodle? Oh, fantastic, Ozzy. Thank you so much. That's so great to see everything that we've been speaking about being represented there. Um, and yeah, yeah, the DCDC organisers will um, share this after the event. Um, maybe while we wait um, to see if anyone would like to join or ask a question, um, uh, one thing that came up um, several times in the presentations was um, the importance of maybe having digital mentors, um, so people further along in their career who um, can support and help you. Um, I'm going to stop there actually because I can see Melinda is joining us and she has a question so um, I'll, I'll pass over to her so Melinda take it away. 
Oh, thank you, Louise. I didn't mean to interrupt. And I apologise if I switch my camera off. I'll be having a revolting coughing fit. Um, my name is Melinda Haunton. I'm also with the National Archives. And I sort of have to apologise for how archive archivisty this question is but I've been really inspired by some of the things you've been saying about kind of working towards non-traditional outputs and valuing different ways of working because digital is different and I just wanted to think in the context of an early career how important is it to you that a lot of those outputs are going to be quite ephemeral digital is much harder to keep than you know a journal article which you can be pretty sure will still be there when you need to apply for a job in 15 30 years time and I was just really interested in that and the impact of, of that and whether that's a consideration for you. Thank you, Melinda. Is there anyone who'd like to volunteer to take that? Uh, Gareth, I'm going to pull your hand back. Yeah, uh, well, very quickly, uh, that does that does interest me and worry me. And it's not just about it being digital and ephemeral. Some of our outputs are simply the conversations that we have, which you cannot track. Uh, and some of them are methodological questions that might not end up with an answer. And getting any funding body to give you more money on the basis of, no, we need to talk more, is quite difficult. So that's my kind of uh, view of it. But I think other people might have some more specifically digital answers to that. Thank you. Karina? Um, I worked specifically with the legacy project at uh, KDO, and I can vouch to the instability of did non-traditional digital outputs and the, the importance really of uh, putting in the longer term plan um, right at the outset of a project. Uh, normally, you'd expect a, a front end sort of audience facing platform to have maybe a life of three to five years, which is not that long if you're uh, if you're if you are in an early career research uh, position. So do try to think about the back end. Obviously, archives can be preserved on their own uh, on their own merit and in, in more stable form. But I think it would be really helpful to think across different public facing outputs if you are looking at digital outputs because they have a very short shelf life and they're expensive to maintain. Really good points. Do you want to come back with anything on that, Melinda? Um, just to say that I'm so glad that Karina said much of what I would have really wanted people to say. So I'm glad it's on your minds. And uh, and I hope it won't put people off thinking about these more creative and uh, and kind of engaging digital outputs, because it's so important to uh, to take that out beyond um, beyond academia. So thank you very much. Thank you, Melinda. Um, yeah, we just need to um, needs a bit more thought into the long term when you're working digital things. Um, I can see Herbert's put a question in the chat. Herbert, would you be willing to um, come to the table and ask it? You can turn your um, camera and mic on if you're willing. Um, I'll maybe read it out and we can go from there. So Herbert's asked um, for early careers, what advice can you give for people that might want to take a master's, especially if they're doing a multidisciplinary approach. Um, has anyone got any thoughts in response to that one? Uh, Anita? I think, yeah, I think it's very exciting. So I definitely, I'm coming from this background and I work in this background. So I think it is very exciting. It's just, uh, you need probably a bit more um, resilience to know that and more uh, 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 how you get on with it, and and you will probably be a bit need a bit more independence in terms of managing the cross uh, uh, the difference in terms of the disciplines and uh, uh, and using the mentors and the disciplines for your advantage. I think that's probably would be my best advice to take out uh, what you need from the different disciplines and, and make it for your own. Thank you, Anita. Um, I've maybe got one last question before we go, if there's um, no one else joining. Um, so my question that I was going to ask earlier was just around mentors, and I'll maybe put it to you, Amy, because it's something you mentioned in your presentation. So if people feel that they don't have a digital mentor at the moment, have you got any advice for what they might do? Um, I think particularly because of the nature of the interdisciplinary worlds that we work in, often there isn't a clear carved path it's not that when you start a position often that someone is assigned as your mentor has that background they might have knowledge of your subject area they might have knowledge of academia the particular kind of course you're working in but they might not have that digital archive 
knowledge and particularly that's been my experience and um, so possibly this is kind of a thought for those working in the area in terms of archives if you could offer some of your mentors if you have partnerships if you have kind of collaborations with senior academics who could offer that and there was some way to kind of centralize it so because maybe those kind of pockets of experience aren't in universities particular smaller ones such as myself and you have to branch out as well so if there was some kind of in some broader networks and kind of broader national mentor scheme I think that would be very welcome. Thank you, Amy. Um, and yeah, just to plug for us at the National Archives, we do a lot of digital mentoring. So if you explore our website, you should hopefully find um, some good links.